I talked about this last year. So last year I came to this thing and um, I, you know, I read all the stuff and I saw well, nobody's talking about prioritization. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. And uh, it seemed to be helpful. And uh, but I had I just talked about all sorts of stuff. So today I figure I'll just focus just on this one thing. And it's capacity allocation. Um, it's complicated to be able to get to the point where you can do capacity allocation effectively, at least by the standards I'm going to be talking about. It's not that hard, but there's just things you have to do. I'm calling them, they're like ingredients that you have to do. Um, and yeah, we'll get into all that. But uh, I guess there's going to be at least one empty space here. But uh, I'm just curious where you guys work, which of these domains? Product. Product. Is that all of you? I'm going to overlap in product and engineering. OK. <coughs> nobody here, nobody here. I wouldn't expect anybody, but because yeah. yeah. uh, um, it's what I'm talking about is a tool. It's usually, this is the role. It's, it's their tool. And it, to um, to it helps solve a lot of the struggle and, and uh, 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 debate over agenda between these two groups. It answers a lot of their questions, and it also gives them a voice. So often, these people really love it too because they're like, finally, a solution for doing work that they know is critical, but has nothing to do with the product roadmap and doesn't result in any metrics changing, mm -hmm. like switching servers out or, you know, updating them. In this context, ID, predominantly infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, like that kind of IT. It, it, considering we have this, yeah, yeah just, yeah. Uh, or, know? well, but, but, yeah, but also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. both. Um, in, uh, in a normal sense, uh, capacity allocation, as, long, as far as engineers are concerned, <coughs> that is predominantly the domain of the engineering team, right? Like yeah. the engineering director will say, okay, I can only give you X or Y number of people. Yeah. So um, how does product... Will, will yeah, be that's that? exactly what... That's resources versus capacity is one of the... Dis we'll have to discuss that or define that. Because uh, capacity allocation is like... They're all capitalized, but that's like a capitalized practice within the Kanban method. Are you guys familiar with the Kanban method? I know of it, but I'm not a... You, yeah. Have you heard of classes of service? Okay, so the, the Kanban method has a large body of practices, like a lot, very large. Um, almost, even this morning, almost everything I hear people talk about is, it's very shallow and doesn't talk about pretty much even the fundamentals of it. So we're going to talk about parts of it. One of them will be class of service. I think we'll have enough time for that. Um, but capacity allocation is one of the things you can do if you have some of those building blocks of the Kanban method in there. Uh, I didn't catch where he's from. But <coughs> oh, okay. Um, anyway. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to ask also, uh, which which domain are you uh, in? Product. You're also product, okay. So that's basically what you should expect from. Uh, so first question is, uh, who has a stake in what your organization delivers or when it's delivered? Who, who has a stake in that? I mean, oh. so you do. <laughs> I'm assuming you do. Yeah. So, me, and it's basically, For us? yeah. But who else? Business. Business. And uh, how about some job titles? Director of Product Management. Merchandise. <laughs> yeah. Depending on like the, the, the business you're in, but but uh 
Yeah, th do these people uh, own the roadmap? No. They, exactly. They, yeah. they are responsible for PMS. Yeah. Okay, can I have anything like it? They are extremely extremely influenced. They they influence, but they're power. Yeah, like Game of Thrones type of influence, or I mean, like, they don't really own it. Uh, yeah, they may not own it, but they can say, no, this is a lot more valuable to me. Yeah. yeah. And they can, because they are responsible for PML, yeah. they can come up with the numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's easy to justify. Yeah. Any any others? So outside of business, who might have a stake? Yeah. In, in sales, white sales, 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 sales. Stuff. about if your roadmap includes new functionality and the infrastructure or platform for that doesn't exist yet? Oh, so when you say IT, you're talking about like just architecture? Yeah, architecture, all the, yeah. Jobs, that, yeah. That, that yeah. The, the, the thing that makes, yeah, that have those so like, uh, so new functionality that also means instead of like being a boutique firm with, you know, a certain amount of users, now it's a SaaS and there's thousands and thousands of uh, classes of scale. Yeah, that, that, that sort of healthcare domain. environment. Sort of, yeah. Meaning they, they're, the, oh, they're the only ones who could do this. No matter how hard you do your job, you'll that's never right. be able to do this. Like that's, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. So it's an IT, a couple of things will come into picture. One, they will not own or influence the product or roadmap. They can actually influence time to market. If they yes. actually say we need X amount of servers and we don't have budget, so it can prolong the process. Yeah. But still they will not own the roadmap. They definitely don't own it. I, I think most likely I'm going to assume this group, whoever, whatever the job title is, but that group essentially owns the roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, they may be steered mm -hmm. by somebody, but they kind of, it's theirs, it's not theirs. Yeah. Not really theirs. Maybe they, they own a different kind of roadmap. Uh, but which, pe what people in, in, in like this sort of IT group? The question is, uh, who uh, who has a stake in what your organization delivers, or when it when it's delivered? And I use the word organization because, uh, say, you work at PayPal. Uh, how about just onboarding feature group or onboarding group? Or if you work at Visa, merchant acquisition organization, not the issuing. So uh, you, you may not be the entire company. You might just be having a roadmap for a section of it. In my world, uh, IT actually goes under CTO. Uh -huh. So in business and IT, it's both under CTO. Okay, yeah. So okay, um, so I, I guess uh, I'll just go to the, ne the, the next question and close this is um, do they have the same agendas? No. Are they totally aligned? What, 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 what are just a couple of conflicts of agenda we can just list right now. Product managers uh, actually care about uh, customer benefit. So customer the customer benefit. word came up, yeah. which I would argue. Oops. They have a stake <coughs> in what you deliver and when, yeah. especially the key accounts. So depending on how your organization is structured, like your, your business model, I should say, is structured, uh, external customers uh, might have a seat at the table mm -hmm. in the roadmap. Okay. Directly or indirectly. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so yeah, the, the agenda here is customer benefits. For what purpose? Like, why does that matter? Uh, because we are actually uh, identifying the needs of the customer, fulfilling it, and at the same time innovating and growing the business. Uh, and um, the second stakeholder would be uh, the business team. 
there are some people human, so they are more interested about the margin mm -hmm. and not too much about. They are they are more interested in business outcome, the business impact. Yeah. And I'm just thinking so like long term versus short term. I guess like as a product manager, I'm concerned more about two, three, four years. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, you know. Stuff like churn and typically profitability doesn't really seem to care about stuff like churn. Yeah. They want to make their quarter on a big year. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a bit more generic, but uh, time horizons are just different. Yeah. That's for sure. Especially depending on uh, how, how people are evaluating or uh, what kind of KPIs you have. Exactly. How about uh, customer service or customer success? What, what, what would, what's their agenda as far as like what gets delivered to customers and when? Oh, you, should, you said attention. Yeah. Attention. How about um, for a uh, SaaS or not, but uh, the, the customers are Lockheed Martin, uh, uh, Ingersoll Rand, uh, John Deere, uh, Bank of America. Uh, retention might be a function of what is the what does the director of procurement say or the CIO say. Uh, what what would the customer success org? What would their agenda be? Customer happiness. Huh? Customer happiness. And, and why? Uh, why? Yeah, like why? Why would that be a thing that they care about? Uh, I, I shouldn't say why. I, I should ask why. I should ask how. In, in how how can that be impacted or improved or uh, decreased? Uh, by definition, they want to make sure that customers are safe. Do they need to get that and achieve their business objectives? Yeah, what I was, was kind of fishing for is um, uh, do they want a quarterly release of new products? And probably not at, at uh, for example, the Department of Defense. Probably does not want a quarterly new product release because of all the loopholes and all the things, rigmarole they have to go through on their end, right? So maybe their agenda is slow down pile up features, and then refactor them all, and then let documentation and our, like, our training consultants and all those people catch up, and then we'll release it. You know, that so they, well, maybe it's speed up, because they have a problem that yes. they're getting pinged at every single day, and they want to fix and ship. Yeah. So it's all very different. Yeah. So, yeah, it, yeah it, could, it could be, for your great idea, slow down, for their urgent need, speed up. And then, in, in fact, stop what you're doing and fix this. It, it, you guys have probably gotten that request before. Stop stop what you're doing and focus on this right now. Yeah. Sometimes these are the guys who ask that. OK. <coughs> so I mean, this, this is basically obvious. You know, there's, there's multiple people with different agendas, and they all have a stake in the roadmap. And is if there's not a method to manage that, there's going to be politics that manages that. Politics is actually a method. Um, it's just usually ill-defined. And it's not managed very well, usually. So uh, the best, the best uh, solutions don't always win. So we're going to look at an alternative. And so I, I, I put the word out there, uh, capacity allocation. And uh, it already did come up. What's the difference between resource allocation and capacity allocation? Uh, 
I didn't know when I first was introduced to this. So. Yeah, I'd say uh, uh, re resources are more, much more likely to be tangible than this isn't. I mean, it's actually, it's not. You, you put a tangible thing into the empty space in a tangible situation. Um, one, one way I can describe it is uh, an elevator is a resource and it has a capacity of uh, you know, 20 people or 1,500 pounds or something. So this is more like an attribute or quality. Uh, this is uh, um, like your, the ability of how, how many new ideas can you come up with in the next hour that you can't consider that to be a resource. That's one reason why I think like time tracking and doing all that kind of traditional project management stuff doesn't really work in knowledge work very well. But that, that's, that's, that doesn't make as much sense for resource. Uh, you could categorize that kind of stuff as resource, but as capacity, it's like, well, capacity wise, over time you can see, well, how much stuff are we able to do? Yes? And you may not tell you that but that yeah. mean no, no, it definitely says what, how many resources are there, 10 developers. Of course, swap five out for a new five. Is it the same capacity? The week after Labor Day weekend, same capacity as the week before? I'm not, I'm not the, even though the resources are exactly the same. The other thing about resources is spending. So uh, I don't consider uh, labor to be a variable cost. Uh, un unless you're only talking about contingent workforces where the contracts win. Because otherwise you have to spend somebody, you have to spend 100% of somebody's salary no matter what. It's a fixed cost, you know. So this is the thing that you can control. There's a huge amount of flexibility and power if you understand capacity and can start controlling that. Uh, so I just wanted to get into that mindset. Uh, what was the next question? Uh, okay, so the ingredients. So to be, first, to, to be able to know what your capacity is, I'm, I'm going to suggest uh, a quick path to get there. That's what that box is. Anybody have an idea what this, that might be? It's a representation of something. Just curious. I, I, I mentioned Kanban method. Excel. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wish I had a sticky, but I don't have one. So that's what it would have been. So this is a, a, a drawing of a sticky. But it's basically work. It's a work item. And one of the building blocks to be able to control capacity and be able to allocate capacity according to these different agendas, uh, you need to be able to point at different work items. If work is just sort of like this big long list and there's all these dependencies between everything, it's very difficult to be able to separate that stuff out. So that's one reason why most Agile methods, Kanban itself, uh, starts to make work visible and the work itself making it visible by putting it onto a card or a digital card or a drawing. Uh, once again, when it's just uh, in paragraphs or, or, or lists and stuff like that, it's not quite the same effect. It can be, but you can get lost. You, you can lose some of the attributes that you retain as long as you keep it this way. So first ingredient is to be able to identify the work, having its one work item separate from the other, and be able to count them. That's an important part, to be able to count it. Does that make sense? Is that something that you guys do right now? Like user stories, for example. That's, that's the typical one. Now, initiatives or, um, uh, you know, non-user story type of work can also be treated this way. So, for example, like litigation requests at a law firm or uh, um, marketing research requests in a, in a, within a, a market research group, they could also itemize and um, visualize their work that way too. But uh, by starting with that, 
we can count the work. All right? So right now there's two, now there's three. So we know what the total number of work items there are. That's, that's, a, massive, that's, that's a critical building block for capacity allocation. And the second is visualizing the workflow. So any idea what these might be? Uh, they're, they're, I'd call these columns, and, and, and this, this is a nomenclature issue that uh, may never be resolved, but generally a swim lane would be horizontal, and, and these would be columns. That's, that, once you start getting into like setting up elaborate systems in the software tools, then it kind of matters a little bit more, but otherwise it doesn't really matter. But yeah, so it's, uh, and what are, they, uh, what are they representing? Yeah, it's a, it's a work process, it's a workflow. So work starts here and goes through steps and then it's done. Scrum does that, you know, a lot of people do that. <clears throat> so visualizing the work itself, visualizing the workflow itself, those are two separate things because we want to see the work in real time in the workflow. that makes sense? So we can count how many are in there. How much work is in progress? Seven. But that's, the, that's one way of answering that question. What if right here, this is the commitment point? Meaning, this is an idea that we're still talking about, but we haven't decided to actually do it. You certainly are not allowed to talk to customers about this yet. Like, these people, just because they see this user story or this epic here, they can't tell their customers and promise anybody about it because we haven't committed to doing it yet. That, that would be a pretty critical part of a, of a, a map modeled workflow like this. So then, this being a starting point, especially for doing things like measuring throughput and stuff like that. You really don't want to include any of this in measuring throughput, okay? But that's the main thing, is be able to count the work and be able to count the work sort of where it is. And so, to be able to, contr to, be able to control the capacity, I don't know why, oh yeah, it's a mouse thing here. This guy told me last time. Ah, shoot. Uh, the guy came in and helped, and it came on, and neither of us knew why. probably could. Uh, anyway. Hmm. Yeah, all we did was pull this thing out. And then it just kicked in. Something worked. Yeah, just you know, press the input thing. Yeah, too bad we didn't. Yeah, I don't know. It just came out. I think I woke it up just by touching the screen. But yeah, anyway, that's that's frustrating. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, you can you've, you've made the work, so you can count it. You can see it in the workflow. You can count it. This is in progress. Um, the reason I mentioned this commitment point by, by defining the difference between stuff that we know and we've, we've decided sounds like a good idea but we haven't actually decided to do is just this action is already beginning limiting work in progress. So you're familiar with work in progress and WIP limits, that kind of concept. Uh, 
was not asked. Once, when you're in a position where you're doing that, and I would suggest you actually don't really need anybody's permission to do that, especially as a manager. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a, punching the stuff until it worked. Um, once you're in a, uh, uh, so you can, you know what the work is, you can count it, you can limit the whip. Um, I was just, yeah, we're good, oh, we're good. Uh, just kind of poking this thing until it comes off. Um, I was just suggesting that you can limit work in progress without permission from anybody else in the company, if, especially if you're a manager. Because as far as they're concerned, um, this stuff is also on your to-do list. But as from, from your role as a manager, you can say, okay, well, we, you, this is non refutable We have to do this, but this is what we're going to do. In this way, you can control your capacity of whatever sort of organization or domain you have. Does that make sense? So you have to do it all, but at the same time, simultaneously, we're only going to have, in this case, a total of six. So with that foundation, you can uh, start allocating capacity. Because your capacity was basically a decision. What is my work in progress limit? Five, 10, 20, 1,000. That's a decision. So you've just decided what your capacity is. It has nothing really to do with your budget, how many people you have, or how much time you have. It's the number of work items you've got. That's the capacity I'm talking about. And so it's, it's oh, I erased it, but it, that's, it's a radically different way of looking at capacity than like resource allocation and the typical, you know, trying to think of how, you know, in this team, what kind of capacity do we have? It's, it's much more simple than that. It's all based on that, right? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it is. It, it, I don't make a decision just out of the blue what my capacity is. I do it based on my resources and my skills and my time. Yeah. The, the, yeah. And the, all, so all the stuff that matters is factored into this. So you can just arbitrarily pick a number. Like I, I could say, oh, no, it should be five. Well, the, I, the numbers arrived at in different ways. And if you're, are you familiar with Little's Law? Cumulative flow diagram? Uh, those are those are those will take another ten minutes. I don't I don't want to get into those. They're, the math is extremely complicated to prove that Little's law works. Ignore all of that. It's basically very simple. One you know delivery rate equals average work in progress divided by average uh, lead time. So you need to know what the average lead time is. But that's very simple. But that would, that would help you know, like, well, should it be five or should it be seven? A more simple way is if you have, like, consistent rules on when something is done and able to move to the next column. The only thing you need to know, should we increase or decrease the whip limit, is you just look, are things staying in here too long and not moving on? And so downstream workers are not, they have nothing to do. So. I, I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, yeah. Is there an assumption here that all these work items are commingled? No. Okay. I was I didn't know if I was going to get that question. It's in another slide. Okay. It kind of represents, but that that's a very common question for my next talk, which is on estimation. But uh, but no, it doesn't matter. So it, it, looking at here, there's a lot of different. There, there's actually a lot going on in this slide. Um, it's, 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 it's like several different practices and lessons in it. But for, for now, if you look at the top row, you can see, you know, essentially these are, these are work states. So developing the business case for something, writing the software. And those numbers underneath, that's what the work in progress limit is. So through, you know, Little's Law or, you know, other means, They've arrived at you know five business cases at a time. Are that's the best limit for the fastest throughput overall, not just theirs but everybody's. 
um, notice if you, if you add all of these, 3, 3, 3, 4, 5, 5, 3, how many total is that for this work group? Yeah, options wouldn't be counted. And I should say release, release uh, I, actually I, I've changed my opinion about that, but for in this slide it's not included. Yeah, it, sh it should be, but maybe it's already released. Put a little D in there and fix the slide. But uh, um, if it's, yeah, it, it sort of depends on what your definition of done is. Um, so then if you, if you look on the uh, left side, there's four, four, four cards. There, it's basically a legend. Uh, each of them has a number on it. And it's es essentially, each of these cards is a different kind of work. And so what you've done is allocated, well, for the blue cards, the maximum of four of those kind of cards on this board at, the time, at one time. So when you get into this options column and you're thinking, like, well, what work should we start next? Well, uh, I can't really tell the code from down here, but one of them you can't pull in because you've already got too many. Oh, yeah. The question is, can you pull a blue card into this board? That's the, and that's why it's a question. But that, that, that question gets asked explicitly and a policy decision can be created immediately because of this visualization approach. This is one of the ways Kanban affects the way processes operate in a company. So anyway, um, that's, that would be a policy decision. You know? So why is it delayed? Uh, so does that make sense? About, you know, there's a, there's a total number of work items available, and then there's a ratio or a proportion of which type of work gets, uh, you know, how much of the capacity can be taken by one type of work versus the other type of work. Does that make Is sense? Is that because of the skill sets that they need? Or it's because of a policy, a business decision, a management decision. So back to here. So, but, but does it, does it make sense? Basically, you can have 20 cards. You can have six of these, four of these, and 10 of those. But it's more based on business outcomes. And which has to do with strategy and the overall, maybe other agendas, maybe the, this quarter's goals, objectives, key results, whatever might be driving the, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with the business. That's what starts to shape those allocation amounts. But what might those be? So what, what might be one reason? You mentioned skill set. So capability. Right. Let's say you got one person who knows how to get into the old mainframe. So we can do one at a time. You have two in there. It means you've said yes. We can start this. But that work is just sitting there in his inbox and he's not doing it, right? So what's another reason to increase or decrease the proportion of capacity of you know, one agenda or one type of work compared to another? How about in customer service? Yeah, or well, yeah, the, the business value of people. Yeah, what drives, what, what defines business value? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at that, so what's just an example? I mean, it depends upon the kind of business, but I mean, it could be revenue, it could be profitability, Time frame that we can build directly. Yeah. So, for example, a project one that's a two year timeline. And then there's project two, I should make it A and B. Project B is a six month timeline. So, uh, Maybe one involves lots of infrastructure work or some lean experimentation, which is basically the same skill set. So these developers have to build like crappy mock-ups to show customers, um, or like put it out in the in the production under A/B testing or something like that. Um, so, but you got to start it now because 
to get this whole thing done. It's, so, so that means even though it's not starting or it's not due for a long time, you want to start it now. So it needs a presence on that board. But then there's this other thing, you only got six months left. So maybe it's they're equal. These two projects are equal and they both are considered new projects. They're in that green group of you know the 12, 12, you can allocate 12 of those. But you know, four months into this, you might start to say, okay, let's reduce this a little bit and increase this a little bit, add another category. That, that's, that would be a, a capacity allocation action or uh, management decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, project team might have a hard task for a long time for the phase that they're exactly. we are right now. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. So that, that's one that's one way of, of, of thinking about how to do this. Actually, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the green project. But sometimes even the value of this is not really a sure value until you totally. get the AB test. Yeah. Right? That, and that's where I personally have an issue that people are throwing darts at all kinds of stuff. It'll take a million dollars, two, three. Yeah, people try to ascribe value to things, yeah. and uh, the, any formula that they use, and I've been exposed to a lot of them, are uh, all junk. Um, I hope this isn't just like a 10-minute thing each time. But uh, yeah, so um, so value is a tough one. Um, uh, I typically refer to this stuff as uh, different types of work. So if you can differentiate between those, that's why I brought up. It didn't come up. That's why I brought up uh, uh, customer service. What types of or what type of work? does the uh, customer service or maintenance and support uh, teams work on? How does any of this have to do with priority? Isn't that the title of it? Yeah. Well, this, this is, I'm lost uh, by that. By, I'm expecting something different. Oh, uh, this how is... Does, how does this have to do with priority? This is how to get agreement on uh, balancing the, the different priorities be among these people. I don't know if you could read the, the, the description I wrote didn't end up on the wall. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, I'm talking about uh, balancing the uh, priorities amongst these different people. So just, just to make sure that that makes sense, unfortunately this isn't on yet. But um, the, uh, so let's say, uh, New, new products or the product itself is agreed upon. Is this a, a more significant priority? Um, sustainability and um, uh, scalability or reliability is, is, is a minor, but it is also important. How do you make sure that you have work that's moving the ball forward on all of these different agendas simultaneously in the same work group? That, that, prioritiza that prioritization problem and capacity allocation is, uh, is a way to do that. So deciding, for example, within the green tickets, which is the more important one, that would be a different activity or a different, a different well, thing. Well, I, don't, I don't get the green ticket. Like what, what is the difference between a green ticket and a... Well, we can and, talk about... And what, yeah. what you, you said that there was a capacity of... That adds up to 20. Yeah, but is that the capacity or is the capacity 20 of whatever colors? Uh, sorry, th there's only those colors available. There aren't other colors. Right, so right, so, right, from, right. so all work. Let me ask my question yeah. again. Yeah. Is the capacity 20 boxes or is the capacity 12 green? So if, if I have, if I have yeah. 20 greens, is that okay? That's yeah. my question. Uh, I, the capacity is, is 20 boxes. Okay. 
And then the allocation is uh, for, out of the green, out of all the boxes, you can have uh, 12 of the boxes can be green. Okay. You don't want to have more than that. Does then that make that's sense? That's the prioritization, right? That you're saying how that, well, that's, among that's the, the prioritization of all 20. And then, you know, let's say, let's say green boxes are this, I was just getting into this type of work. So new product stuff, features, stuff that customers care about, but we think uh, part of it is account management. So how did you Customer B says they want this. Yeah, so if that's 20% versus 40%, yeah. how did you come to that? If, if that's the priority. They have to discuss that. So they? I would. As part of my yeah, I would, if I would facilitate it, I would do it in a meeting with their boss too. Because this is really a strategic decision. It's a, that's, a, that's a capital allocation decision, really. Well, it depends how big or small this whole thing is. That's true, that's true. We but yeah, so their boss might just be you know, the product director. We tend to manage it on however many people. Yeah, yeah. Relatively Yeah, this, yeah, by the, uh, in, in case that part's not clear, the, uh, the workflow, and I, I really apologize about this not working, and I think the next time a tech person comes in, I'm gonna make sure they actually s explain how, how this. The prioritization part is one of the hardest things. Yeah. Yes. That's why. To me, that is the, the discussion is, which is that, so what you just mentioned yeah. is what we call the strategy. Yeah. So that's exactly what I was hoping you would talk about. Okay, how many, should we, are we talking from yeah. negative numbers? Which is where I think the issue has been for me, which is that, like I said, if oh, I throw nice. darts and flame, my project could work through me. Then the other, other person has to just flame, no, mine is more. But I might have, have to sign up for that. That's, that's the, the hard part is depending on how far yeah. up the tree we have to go, the CEO or whatever is helping us. They sign up for that. Yeah. 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 But then you're never signing up for that whole thing. You're signing up for tech or product research or okay. something else to justify that very much that they would just come in and do it. Okay. So, so you're assuming that all that has happened? Can you, can you kind of summarize that question? Discovery versus build. Yeah. So the discovery stage is, is taking I, ideas, I embedding them, validating yeah. them. Yeah. Prototyping, user testing, coming to some conclusion that yeah, this is this, this is worth building. Yeah. Where does that happen? And on these. Okay. Well, well let's. So uh, yeah, let's let's assume. Uh, so what I was uh, talking about was uh, I'm, I'm going to shift this thing over. So I was talking about the moment before delivery starts. You know, so discovery has happened. Delivery is about to start, and that's what that commitment point was. So if we look upstream from that, the same same concept, but now we're just we're we're focusing in, in including more of what you're you're specifically asking about. Um, you know, identifying opportunities, for example, as opposed to develop, um, testing opportunities, selecting opportunities. Converting them into an actual option. So uh, this would be a workflow for discovery. This is actually the discovery Kanban system. And is that part of your business case? It's starting on that side. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So business case, and I'm thinking that sort of business case would yeah. need enough data to show yes, it's worth it. This this is a board, and, okay. and, and, and keep in mind that pretty much every group that's using a board has a unique board. So definitely don't get attached to that specific board and don't try to implement that specific yeah. one. Is it fair to say we yeah. have a board for business case? Yeah, so that's so basically what this is. The churn in. That's what I just did. Yeah. And, and one of the things I would often say also is that usually a column can become a board okay. or a board would be somebody else's column, depending on where in the management or what your domain is. But uh, so yeah, so, for, so this business case thinking, uh, before you commit to basically 
engineers are going to build it, and QA is going to test it, and well, now there's DevOps, but um, production is getting ready to, to push it, marketing is getting ready to talk about it, sales is getting ready to sell it, especially right here, because you're going to do it. Before that, you're just you're you're in the discovery phase. Um, there could be capacity allocation here as well, and often uh, it might look a little different. Uh, at a higher strategic level, I've coached people to do. Um, are you familiar with Horizon One, Two, and Three? That type of thinking. The, the, what that is, is like this is changes or improvements to current business, current customers, current products. This is uh, you know, expanding on things. There's different ways of thinking about H2. Phase 2, I, I like talking about it as expanding or repurposing existing stuff. So it, uh, there's more certainty about what will happen if you do something. Horizon 3 is generally, nobody's done it before, and we don't even know if it will work, or we don't know if anybody will want it. But to, to balance capacity across all three time horizons in new product development. So like the guy this morning was saying, in like two years, three years, technology would be totally different. You should have some work in progress right now preparing for that. Of course, you need to like continue the revenue flow, increasing margins. This might be growth. One way of looking at it. But that would be, so you want to make sure, like, well, how much work is happening in each of these uh, horizons? How we allocate our capacity across that? You want to spend 90% of your time playing around with, like, kind of R&D? Or do you want to spend more time, you know, getting an ROI out of all of your effort? I guess, and, and what balance? I, I guess when you say that, actually, you Probably you don't have risk because you know, it's like yes. you know, thinking ahead and investing in the future. Absolutely. Very high risk. Although the long term risk is the other way around. It's a whole chain. But the but cost of delay is different. Yes, all of the things mm -hmm. out there. So, but, but you could also be wrong. So, which is why if you spend a lot of effort in the three, right? And instead of being wrong, you spend a lot of effort in the wrong stuff there. In H1, I'm presuming you know enough about your business that you know, yeah. okay, if I make money in six months, I am likely to make it. Make 20 more phone calls yeah. per salesperson per day, you'll get this many more sales. Yeah. You, basically, you, you know that kind of stuff. I, I, put, uh, I wrote up cost of delay, I didn't want to yeah. forget. So um, about yeah. risk, especially like what's the difference between this risk and this risk, right. it's like, well, there's, there's an impact, and the, so there's the volume of impact, there's the probability of impact, that's risk, but then what's the uh, urgency in that? And cost of delay uh, functions, you know, usually some kind of a curve, should, should include the risk, but also the urgency. So like, maybe never, so like we have an infinity amount of time to finish this work, or we got six months, or here it's probably the sooner, the sooner, we, the earlier we make money. So that, that would be a, a cost of delay function. And it also depends on how small market size is. Really yes. How rapidly the market is changing. Yeah. Kodak. Yeah, totally uh, technology driven businesses definitely allocate more here. Like the or hotel the business. Replacing your business yeah. Well, no, no, so I just said hotel business. Maybe I shouldn't have. But uh, a stable business, funeral homes perhaps. Maybe they're spending a lot more and very little here or none. They just outsource this to somebody else's idea and they can copy it. Um, I mentioned uh, cost of delay. So these categories, you know, there's like a you know, the silver card, red one, green one, blue one. You know, different types of work. It could be allocated by uh, project. Uh, it could be uh, allocated by time horizon or some other kind of agenda. But the work itself, what type of work is it? We, we have got that, the, the customer service. Bugs, you know, uh, bugs in production, bugs in pre-production. Um, technical debt. Technical debt. So those are different kinds of work. And so maybe some of those are more important than others. New features, new features promised to marquee clients. 
new features that the CEO's cousin likes, new features that the other guys do, but it's outside of our strategic uh, focus, but it might become a table stake in the future. You know, so there's different things like that. For how do you differentiate the types of work? Like what's the difference in this thing between a, a silver and a blue or a red? What, what makes those things different? How do you categorize them? Well, one way also is to do it by cost of delay. And a very simple way to implement cost of delay without a lot of math, the math is all included and embedded in this stuff. But, um, and there's been math to prove that it works, is a very simple curve profile. Draw it like that. It's just four categories, four, four, four ca classifications of uh, cost delay. So the first one is just standard. So the longer we wait, the more we lose, the more it costs us. A second is, can you imagine what might be happening here? This is sudden, yeah. So it's, and it's based on time. So this, this is. We know the date, because it's actually, it's, it's here. We don't, you know, the scale doesn't matter, but the, the fact is, there's a deadline on this one. No deadline here, just the sooner the better. Here, there's a deadline. Miss the tax season, screw it. Miss, the, miss spring break, you're not selling any spring break on sale items, right? So this one, it's costing you a, a whole lot already. It's, all, it's like, you know, your, your server farm is on fire. Thing. And then this one, uh, still the, the term people will typically use is intangible. And what they mean is it's an intangible cost of delay. You can't calculate it. For example, well, should you or should you invest in this technology? I don't know. Maybe it will never be useful. Or um, somebody had mentioned, I think, about uh, something that IT would want to do, oh, like technical debt, but. Uh, but something else, and uh, That's four minutes. yeah, the uh, uh, you, uh, you, you know it's something that would be a, a reasonable, uh, sustainable thing to do. I, I think that was the term that was used as sustainable. But anyway, it was um, it's we know it's the right thing to do, but compared to all these other priorities. We always just delay that one. We don't start it. Because these are clearly measurable and sometimes super important cost of delays. We don't know what that one is. So the reason why these IT guys generally really like this type of capacity allocation, it gets their agenda on the board when you can make a policy. In this case, there's four. I'm going to suggest that four, uh, the blue cards, are infrastructure or maintenance or health of the system work. Not new products, not new features. So it's not necessarily in the product roadmap, but it's work that's being taken up by those teams for somebody else's agenda. And there's four of them up there. And one thing about uh, cost delay is you can assign each of these a class of service, which uh, is also another more concrete product or prioritization technique is class of service. You can take the work item, whatever it happens to be, new feature, uh, maintenance or you know, bug fixing, of uh, you know, non-critical non bugs, assign it into one of these four uh, cost delay categories. These themselves can also be your, your default classes of service. I would, I would recommend reading more about classes of service. But this could be standard which means first in, first out, or whatever other kind of policy you have. If you come up with this, the first work item on Monday, the second work item on Tuesday, you pick the Monday one first. It's that kind of thing. That's standard. So due date, class of service. That, this work takes priority over standard work. So like on the airplane, First class gets to board first, or uh, expedite, 
So expedite generally it means this work always cuts in line. So in this case, it would be the silver card. If any time, uh, in, in actually I think specifically the way this one's designed, that bottom lane is uh, it's 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 breaking the work work in progress limit of twenty. It's just we have to do it, so just add it. Yeah, you know, and that's that should be built into the lead time distributions and everything. Another way of utilizing expedite is. Um, this, this third one, intangible, I call it uh, standby for this reason, like in the airline analogy, the work is important, so the passenger is important. They did buy a ticket, but not a lot. And so anytime one of these things shows up, boots it off the plane. So this is all maintenance. So it's like work that needs to happen, but by when? I don't know, but it does need to happen. Give it, give it a presence on the board, give it a limit, and also in your another prioritization tool, which is class of service, is uh, agree that anything that becomes more urgent, like once these you know, items that are due on a certain date are at risk of missing that date, boot all of these off the board or stop them all, don't pull any new ones until the more urgent stuff gets done. Does that make sense? Class of service cost delay. Okay. All right. Thanks.